Thanks. Thank you, Asika. Um, <clears throat> there's so many different dimensions that we can talk about, and I think we'll hear us probably all talk about slightly different dimensions that I think respond to some of the things that you uh, put forth in your introduction. So I'm Paul Hirsch. Um, I'm an associate professor. I'll stop sharing this here. So we can I'm associate professor at the State University of New York. I teach leadership, uh, ethics, and decision making. And um, well, yeah, what I want to do is kind of zoom in and think about this question of what is the role of AI, the potential of AI uh, in supporting um, various aspects of governance and governance decision making. And just think about some of the tensions, issues around that and, and provide a just some concept, concepts we're thinking through that may or may not support some of the other discussions. When I think about uh, decision making in a, in a governance process, uh, specifically as opposed to a private setting, it's very clear that decision making must unfold in such a way that it has to uphold the collective good. That's very clear. And that, that's not a one shot deal. Uh, that requires building trust and building community and building institutions and building that, that fabric that that decision making relies on over time. Um, so particularly when, as is often the case in a lot of governance settings where we have both on the one hand, deep uncertainty about the world and, and what's going to happen if we make certain decisions and also value conflicts. Um, making decisions in those contexts is not just a question of coming to the best possible decision. It's also a question of doing it through the appropriate process. And as he mentioned, you know, Herbert Simon, who also a long time ago makes this distinction between substantive and procedural rationality. Substantive being decision-making that achieves the goals we want through the optimal means or the best means. Procedural meaning making the decision through the appropriate process. And that process is designed to support the range of goals that we need to uphold, not just in that specific decision, but in the wider institutions and society that we're a part of. Um, so the question then becomes, what is the role of artificial intelligence and, and in this type of process, particularly in a governance setting, that demands both substantive, you know, Asim was showing some really great substantive tools, right, to, to help us make better substantive decisions, but it also requires procedural and maybe other types of rationality as well. So I wanna just see if we can flesh out and, and zoom in on the types of decisions that people, people working in a governance context must navigate, and that AI, if it's gonna be in that context, must also navigate or perhaps partner with people in the right way so that they get navigated. Um, so I want to think of these decision scenarios as, as uh, entailing the navigation of trade-offs in three different dimensions. So trade-offs in 3D is what, what I'm saying is we have to uh, look at for governance decision making. And the first dimension is the knowledge dimension. In any decision in a governance setting, there's a lot of moving parts. There's things that are known. There's things that are unknown. And decisions have to unfold that take into account of what is known, that try to perhaps with big data increase what is known, but also make decisions in spite of the unknown. So there's the knowledge dimension. The second dimension is the values dimension. There's multiple and conflicting agendas. Um, decisions play a role in the public values, the public good at multiple scales. Um, and some of our values are explicit. We know what they are and, and some we learn through the process. And so somehow AI and or humans have to deal with these multiple and conflicting value sets. And the third dimension is, we can call it the political dimension. Uh, within any decision process in the government setting, there's always things going on at multiple scales and one decision doesn't just mean something for that decision, it means something in multiple ways and in multiple contexts. Again, some explicit and some quite hidden. And in that, some people always have more of a voice and more of an access to influence the decision making process and more, uh, information and knowledge that gives them the tools to do so. So a government decision maker must navigate each of these dimensions really simultaneously. Um, <clears throat> and that decision maker themselves has material <coughs> interests, has pre-existing values and biases, and they're themselves embedded in multiple political processes. So when we think of AI, perhaps artificial intelligence can mitigate some of the tensions and challenges that come up with this, um, but I think it's important to think it through. So if we're in the knowledge dimension, you know, thinking about the role of AI, we have to, we have to deal with these epistemological questions, right? What is, how does the AI, uh, can, yeah, and I think Brad and others will get into this, but can an artificial intelligence really know what it needs to know in order to make complex decisions? What is the role of big data in that? 
And once we get to ethics, can artificial intelligence meaningfully, in create, meaningfully integrate different values which may be incommensurable? Or maybe there's a way to commence them to put them in a common metric, but maybe the people who have those values don't feel so good about everything being measured according to a common uh, metric. At the dimension of politics, I would say there's another type of question, and this is what I think I'm personally most interested in. It's, we can call it an ontological question, but really that's to say, what does it mean? What are the implications that it is not a human or not only a human, but another form of intelligence that is navigating these multi-dimensional trade-offs on the public's behalf. Um, and at this third dimension in particular, we have to recognize that, again, that a significant part of the decision process is not coming to the right answer, um, but it's, it's um, reassuring a conflicted and uncertain public that the process itself can be counted on to uphold our values for democracy and for fairness, uh, irrespective of the specific outcome. So again, it's important to pay attention not just to the intrinsic properties of the decision process itself, but to that process as part of a social system, and to pay attention to the impacts of that decision process on that larger system. Um, <clears throat> do we want to know, for example, that a decision maker has to struggle with trade-offs? Do we want to see the furrowed brow on the part of a decision maker that, that's, that's real? I was, I was in the room, I had a friend who was struggling with cancer, and I happened to be in the room with him and his his doctor talking about whether to continue chemotherapy or not, and all of you can imagine horrible implications either way, or just deep uncertainties. And the fact that there was a human being that was willing to acknowledge to my friend that he didn't, he's an expert doctor, one of the top places, but he didn't have the answer, he didn't know the right decision, that somehow his acknowledgement of the uncertainty and uh, the, the deep conflicts that he was experiencing allowed my friend to, I think, own that situation and his own decision in a way that wouldn't have been possible had not the doctor acknowledged in his very being the humanity uh, that he was bringing to the situation in addition to his, his deep expertise. And so I wonder, you know, and I'm sure he was relying on all sorts of algorithms and tools and apps and things as well, but, but how do we uh, make sure that that role is in there? Myself, you know, I just gotta, just to give an, another example, um, maybe we can all relate to, I'm the uh, graduate coordinator in my department and I have to weigh all these things, who gets funding, who doesn't. And there's so many values at play, some of which are explicit, some which are not. And I can, well, I can imagine an artificial intelligence learning through a process of what are these values to play uh, and how do I allocate these different values. And it would probably be good for us as a community to have to make explicit all the different values that are sort of hidden and kind of vague and probably intentionally so. It would probably be good for us to have to make those explicit and yet at the same time, I think having me as someone to blame for failure or me as someone that can call somebody and say, hey, I know you got kind of didn't, didn't get what you needed now, but I'll make sure you get what you need in the future. All those human dimensions that go into having a real decision maker who can take accountability for this conflictual, uncertain, morally ambivalent process um, is difficult for me to think about what role an artificial intelligence plays in that aspect of decision process, particularly, again, in a governance setting. Um, so I'll just end to say, you know, as a decision maker, again, we, you know, we've, we've been debunking the notion of rational, perfectly rational decisions and governance for a long time. And the artificial intelligence seems to be saying, hey, we can make these more rational decisions. Well, I, I, given that decisions are imperfect, what is the role of AI in imperfect decision making? Um, can AI make decisions in the public interest and be a part of a meaningful moral deliberation? and all these uncertainties and ambiguities are on the line. So I just wanted to present that as a context um, for some of these discussions that we get into. And I think from here, I'll pass it back to you to open it up to the panel. Yeah, so thank you so much. And we'll have like an, uh, we want to have like uh, a round of questions for the panelists. Um, and after each round of question, uh, we'll go through uh, and uh, we'll have then a chance to interact and you can ask questions as well. So that's the plan of action. So I think my first question, which I, we have shared the question, but I'll just uh, repeat that. It's like, uh, uh, you know, like in terms of like, what are the challenges and opportunities uh, for public service in terms of uh, these uh, artificial intelligence and big data technologies that are coming our way? So probably like, maybe we can go with the Rob, Dan, Brad, and uh, David, is that a good way? And then we can go to Jane. Um, and you think like five minutes something? Or the yeah, that's fine. So uh, yeah, so maybe just uh, by way of background, I'm just mention that um, I, I spent the of policy and so-called think tanks. 
So I was uh, deeply uh, engaged in public policy more than I am now as a, as a professor. Uh, but uh, it seems to me that one of the one of the great pathologies about public policy, as you learn in Washington, is that um, many public policies fail because they're built on crappy social science. Basically, if they have a model of you have a model of how the world works, and this case is the wrong model. And they build policy on top of that, and so the whole thing comes crashing down when you know, they, they're trying to arrange uh, human affairs in some particular way, and, and, and they have the wrong understanding of how that works. So it seems to me that uh, uh, you know. The great thing about living through uh, you know, public policy uh, issues today is that we do have this revolution going on today in the social sciences where uh, with da between data and computing, and we're just getting a, a much more detailed, nuanced, more scientific, grounded understanding of how, how, how the basic social world works. And so it gives us the opportunity, at least, to do uh, much better policy. You know, whether we do or not is a different issue. Uh, and so in particular, I think that you know, you know, it, it's a, uh, at least, and I work mostly in economics these days, but, but in economics we have this kind of tripartite revolution of, of data coming both from large scale administrative data, so we call that big data. I mean, my astronomer friends say that you know, uh, uh, social science data is not big data because it's not petabytes or exabytes, so it's, it's, it's only terabytes. But basically, when you, when you have all the data on all, all for example, I've been working with data on all American business firms, so all firms that file taxes, we can get access to their data and we can study the, study the firms. Uh, the tax returns, for example, uh, that that is the universe of all data, uh, and so uh, that that is as, as big as it is as the data get. So between the data uh, and the universe of data, and then being able to do experiments. And so my colleague at George Mason, named Vernon Smith, he won the Nobel Prize about a dozen years ago for doing experiments on the human subjects. And so, so we can get data both from these comprehensive databases and then from the human experiments. And then to mix that in with computing, we can now really build models of you know, every individual you know, entity, person, thing. You know, company, whatever, in a, in a social environment, you can really do things that were you know unimaginable be, before. Now, it is fair to say I think that today we're you know, because we're already living through the birth of this of this new approach to social science. You know, all bets are off in terms of how to how to actually manage it properly, how to do it properly. And just and just to be very concrete about that is that yes, of course, data is you know the foundation of all of it, but there are these you know these new uh, fields growing up. There's the, the broad field called data science, also known as you know, data mining, machine learning. And there are many degree programs around, even around this uh, this town between George Washington and the George Mason and Georgetown. Georgetown has the massive data institute. I mean, at every, many universities are trying to get data. UVA just got $100 million from an alumni to build a data science program. There's so, there's, so data science, just, just an example of how you know, we're, we're in the startup phase. What is data science? Nobody really knows what data science is. Well, well why is data a science? You know, how, how, what, what are they, why is it not just, is it just applied statistics? You know, so nobody really knows what data science is, but you know, we, all, we don't get to do more of it just because there's so much we're swimming in data, right? So, uh, so maybe one way, to think, one way to think about it, at least from the point of view of you know, building better policies, is to say, you know, can we build, mo what kind of models do we need? We, let's model, we actually model you know, individual people and doing whatever they do, how they respond to policy, for example. Uh, how do we build models that can eat, that can ingest or digest this kind of micro data? So basically, what, what we have are micro data. We never had that before. Now, as a graduate student, we only had aggregate data. Didn't have, there was no such thing as micro data. Today, I have data on every firm. Uh, Google has data on all of us, right? We'll, we'll put our purchasing habits are. Uh, so, how do we eat micro data? And so, we need to have a new class of models, these kind of, uh, as Ema mentioned, agent based models is one kind of the other kinds of things, micro account metrics. So there are a variety of ways you can deal with these things. But now you, enter, you get into privacy problems, right? The privacy concerns that can you readily identify the data. For example, and this is one kind of example. So, uh, I was involved with a project in the wake of the financial crisis to, to build. Models of housing market bubbles, and so mm -hmm. a conventional model would be, you know, what are the incentives that a, a representative household would face when they're confronted with, say, low interest rates and the housing prices are going up, or whatever? You would write a model for, for what a typical firm would do, uh, sorry, a typical household would do. But uh, what I think that uh, you know what we did was that was different. We basically got, got data on every household in a particular city, so we had basically every housing, every, every house, the housing stock. We had every uh, family from, uh, from a detailed micro sample. We had basically uh, all the mortgage data from a mortgage for the big mortgage service provider. So basically, we were able to build a model of two million households. Uh, but now that, that those data are, of course, deeply uh, you know non-private. I mean, we, we, we tell what Mr. Smith uh, paid for his house and what Mr. Mr. How, how far Mr. Jones was behind in his mortgage payment. I mean, we knew all those things, right? And, uh, and so those are the kinds of uh, privacy issues that are. Today, with uh, you know, as we get into having investments, so 
microscopic data on all of us, right? And, uh, and I think that we have to deal with, we don't know how to deal with those things today. So we're at the birth of an error and we don't know how to deal with that. Uh, so when it comes to AI proper, which is kind of beyond the data, I just have a couple observations. One is that I was a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon when I would call, we were, we're in something with something like the third wave of AI. I mean, this is the gun show wave. I was a student at Herbert Simon. Okay, so Herbert Simon, one of the fathers of artificial intelligence. The first wave was this early thing that didn't, didn't do us. John McCarthy, Herbert Simon, up at Dartmouth. The second wave really was, uh, was uh, when, I was, when I was starting my graduate school career, it was kind of uh, at its epic at its And basically it came crashing down. And, and some of you will know this. It's called the AI, the second AI winter was this now late 80s time, early 90s time, and basically, uh, you know, people had overhyped uh, AI, and they said, well, expert systems will solve all of our problems. Right? So all a doctor needs is a better diagnosis tool, and he'll be able to tell you whether you have, you know, whatever you have, he'll know it. So <laughs> people do a better job than the doctor. And I think that one of the lessons we learned uh, from the second AI, you know, pipe and subsequent winter was that basically AI is not a, is not a silver bullet. It's not going to, it's not going to solve all of our problems. Right? It's, it's, it's yet one more technology. And I think that today, arguably, you know, there's certain kinds of things that have been overhyped uh, and you know, hyped too far. And we'll, we'll probably see this kind of backlash on the power. Having said that, there are certain things that are certainly useful uh, that we can do, and say just even be able to deal with uh, with uh, you know large scale, well, large amounts of data is, is very important. And like, for example, so deep learning. I, mean, I, I don't know how. At least uh, when it comes to some of the deep learning papers, I mean, those sound a lot like hype today. I, won't, I can talk more about that if we have time. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, it, but of course, there are some, some technologies that seem to be quite fertile, but then, then they also have the drawbacks. For example, so blockchain technologies. I mean, blocks, blockchain technologies are, are an interesting way to do privacy and an interesting way to, to do a whole bunch of security and other kinds of, a whole bunch of nice features. But they're also processing like six transactions a minute, where the Visa system is processing 600,000 transactions a minute. So they have their, their bandwidth constrained at the moment. We don't know how to make them go faster. And so we know they have, have some, some nice, Nice properties also has have some crappy properties, and so what's new? We're at the we're at the birth of a new a new era. We don't know how to, we don't know what these things are, are going to ultimately be useful for. I think, and so it's important to pr push forward on all of them. But I think we have to just just be re re realistic about them. And my my final plan to wrap up for now, anyway, is that when it comes to workforce issues, here it turns out that actually, there's been a lot of previous work, and I think some of it is not uh, is not always understood by by you know, people who are talking about this stuff these days. For example. I mean, the first wave of, of automation really happened in the 1950s when things like, um, just as a concrete example, would be something like, you know, in the 1940s in a, in a, in a petroleum refinery, there, were some, there, were, there would be tens of thousands of workers all walking around to every pump and station and turning gauges and stuff. And then by the time the 1960s rolled around, big companies like Honeywell and things that made automatic controllers, where they took the jobs away eventually, all those, you know, so you get a whole refinery to be run by a dozen people. And that was, that was, that was an early example of automation. There are many other examples contemporaneous for that one. And so it turns out that you know, our, once again, our old friend Herbert Simon, he wrote about this at the time. And he said, you know, we, maybe we shouldn't, uh, he said, it's a mistake to think about uh, automation, or now about AI displacement of workers, as, in terms of its, its absolute advantage. So basically, so he, here's, here's what he's saying. He said, don't worry about the fact that, that AI can do things better than you, or better than you as a you know, mid-level manager of the federal workforce. Yet we have to think about it in comparative terms. And this is now, once again, I'm an economist, so, you have to go back to international trade, right? So the simple example is, you know, uh, England can make better machines than France, but France makes better wine than, than England. Okay? So, so they, they, they trade machines for wine, right? Now, what happens if all of a sudden this climate change, which there was, turns out, in 1500, and, uh, and you could grow grapes in London, okay? So what, so what, if, you can, what if you can grow wine suddenly and you produce wine in London? Does that mean the French are going to now suffer? Well, the answer is no, right? Because the French wine is still better than the London wine, okay? So, uh, so it, French can still make, make wine compared, relatively speaking, better than the English. So the fact that there's compared, it's not absolute advantage, it's relative advantage. So we shouldn't worry, it seems to me, so much anyway, about the fact that um, the machines do things better than us, because what we should worry for, what, what it's been displaced is the, thing of, uh, you know, the things that we, we can do better than machines would just be brought to the fore. We, we will basically provide the machines the things that we can do better than them, right? And there are always going to be things that we can do better than them in the foreseeable future, just as a footnote, right? They, when AI comes with the kind of AI we have today, right, it's not, it's not, it's not really uh, AI. Um, it's not that's human intelligence being reproduced computation, right? In the way that, the way that Deep Blue. When I was a graduate student, Deep Blue was actually Deep Thought, and then, which is our, as, as a, just apropos our earlier, earlier discussion, Deep Thought at Carnegie Mellon was basically at the, as the second AI winner hit, there was no funding for Deep Thought, and so IBM bought Deep, bought the whole Deep Thought team and became Deep Blue. <coughs> so Deep Blue, uh, 
him to beating, beating Kasparov using a very different algorithm than, than the actual chess player does. And you may have heard that recently AI algorithms can now, now beat Go players, show a much more complex game than, than, than chess. But it's basically, he wants to using a more elaborate search technique. It's not reproducing human intelligence, it's doing something quite different. And then you may have heard that last year for the first time now, the, the computational player, the AI player, can now, is now the champion poker player in the world. So um, it wants to be using a quite different uh, you know, cognitive engine that, that in what, what was believed to work in you know, cognitive science. So it, there are always going to be things in the near term, anyway, that uh, the humans can do better than, than, uh, than, than the machines. And so I, I personally am not very uh, concerned about, the, about the AI, but AI displacement. Awesome. That's great, Ron. Thank you so much. This is perfect. Um, so, Dan, do you want to take up? Sure. So, obviously, I'm a VM. I have a blue shirt on, um, but I'm wearing yellow. Um, and, uh, you know, you talked about the first phase of AI. One of the things that some of you may have seen this last year was the 50th anniversary of 2001 Space Odyssey. And there's a bit, uh, actually, the, it so happens that the guy who played the lead actor, Dave, is a family friend of my family. And he's been traveling all over the world um, to, with Hal, the computer going to exposés and expositions and talking about sort of the vision of artificial intelligence that they went into the movie with. And Is it the original Hal, by the way? The original Hal no, we, they, 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 wouldn't even work it. Yeah, it's, it, it's sort of, Hal <laughs> is sort of a state of mind. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, but Kier Delay, the actor, um, has been fascinated by the interest in popular culture in artificial intelligence. So it, this is really permeating both the work that we're doing here in public administration and government, but it's also something that, that you know, people are living with every day and they're seeing sort of uh, played out in how they do shopping, how they travel. Um, we talked about different examples of that. So um, uh, I think that we're uh, definitely seeing a, a burgeoning of not just AI, but of, uh, as I talked about earlier about sort of different applications of data analytics and the use of emerging technologies uh, to harness those. Um, so just a quick word. So the IBM Center for the Business of Government that uh, seemed was kind enough to show some of our studies. You stole my prop. Right? I brought this one as a prop, and get this is as a prop. Um, uh, but we publish uh, reports. Uh, Justin Bullock is an author of our from our center. I uh, did a great report on risk management in the U.S. government, and Jane Wiseman is an author who did a report uh, last year on uh, chief data officers uh, uh, for us. So uh, we work with academic experts on sort of addressing topics uh, that are top of mind challenges for government leaders uh, around the world uh, and in the U.S. And um, we actually also published a book last year called Government for the Future, I brought another prop, um, where uh, the, sort of, we had a sort of a chapter in this book called The Future of AI, uh, which was written by David Gray, who was the former uh, CIO or for the Federal Communications Commission, and is now the head of the People-Centered Internet Initiative, working with NSERF. Um, so uh, all of the, our information is available on the website, you can sort of Google Center for the Business of Government and see anything you want. Um, so, so a lot of the work, as, as Seem said, um, that we've done in the last year is focused around AI. We've also done a report on blockchain uh, in government, and we have uh, a number of reports around data analytics and uh, both past and future that we're working on. So to the question of sort of what's the, what are the opportunities and challenges, I'll, I'll kind of go to the opportunity side a little bit. Um, and I think that the point is well taken around, you know, it's, it's, there's been a lot of technologies that have come along uh, ever since the printing press that have, you know, where we've been worried that the jobs will, you know, the world will end and people will, will suffer uh, in terms of, of employment and that sort of thing. And, and almost always, uh, these are economic drivers in terms of, of the engine. And it takes a while to sort of figure out how to make, help the workforce adjust to that, to that new reality. But, but we do as a society kind of, kind of keep moving in that direction. And we think, and this is sort of a broad IBM perspective, that AI really uh, at its best can augment decisions. Um, uh, it doesn't really replace decisions as much as it enables people to make better decisions and allows them to move from what we call uh, low value, and this was part of the report that we wrote, move from low value to high value work. So if you've got a, sort of a repetitive, almost an assembly line kind of data entry model and a compliance model in a lot of government agencies where they're just trying to count stuff make sure stuff happens and fits into boxes. AI can help automate that so that if you're, let's say, a, 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 an inspector, if you're a, an inspector, let's say, at NHTSA, the National Highway Tra Transportation Safety Administration, <coughs> right around the corner from, from here, um, you no longer have to sift through lots of reports. The AI can kind of isolate, well, this type of car had you know, certain types of accidents, and here are the patterns that show that there might be something in common. Maybe they were all made at a particular plant and the AI can help the analysts track that back much more effectively than they could if they had to do that by hand. 
So sort of moving from the lower value repetitive analytics to higher order analytics is one, uh, we, uh, one opportunity and benefit that we're seeing. Another is sort of sort of moving to customer service, right? When you when you call a, a, an e-commerce website, you're often talking to a chatbot, um, and you're seeing government move in that direction. You're, you're seeing more of this technology being used by uh, whether it's uh, the Internal Revenue Service or the Social Security Administration, government agencies that are providing customer service, and much more of this happens obviously at the state and local level. Um, uh, in enabling the government to provide a customer experience that is it's not quite as good, it's moving in the direction of sort of following best practice in the commercial space in terms of providing an excellent personalized real-time interactive experience that, with the privacy and security built in. So you need to sort of overlay the authentication piece so that, it, and this is where one of the challenges that we'll come back to, um, we get to, because it's, you know, some, it, just as, it, as it's easy to spoof a non-AI system and tell that, that system that you're not the person that, uh, that it thinks you are, you know, we need to be careful about building in security and privacy protocols that work at the speed and scale of AI. And that's a challenge. That's something that we don't typically see in sort of the evolution of, a, of an introduction of new, new technology. Usually the efficiency and the throughput is what people think about first. And then the security and privacy folks, and I'm a security and privacy person, so um, I, I want this to be earlier. They come in and say, you know, hey, you forgot about this, that, and the other thing. And then you get companies like you're seeing now just today, Facebook announced we're going to be a security and encryption company. Um, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to move that earlier in the evolution of these technologies as we move into, into the public sector. One of the challenges that this uh, implies is the skill set of public sector workers and companies and researchers working with government to move more from a compliance mindset and into a customer service mindset. And that's both a cultural change as well as a change in sort of skills and interactions that government employees typically don't get in, in their work. They're typically sort of trained in a, a rules-based, law-based, compliance-based, as opposed to a service-based and data-based type of model and how they, they interact with, with citizens. So that, that skill change, I think, is both a, an opportunity as well as a challenge for the workforce. Um, and then uh, the other thing we talked a little bit in the introduction, just around sort of the issues of <coughs> of ethics and understanding bias and making sure that we're transparent about data and AI kind of magnifies this by a factor of 100 in terms because the, again, the scale and speed at which you can uh, take information, make decisions, uh, enable people to kind of reach a decision. If you, let's say you're automating a bunch of that rote work, but you're doing it based on data that's, that's flawed or that there's a bias in the data set because it's based on, let's say a data set that, that's disproportionately and this is one of the famous cases, disproportionately about men who go to work, but now the, there are many more women in a particular occupation. So it's going to it's going to assume things about the cat the categorization of people in that occupation that aren't the reality. Um, so sort of understanding the data, working with data to um, at a, in a training setting to make sure data are are improved. We're, we're seeing this a lot in work we're doing uh, at IBM. For example, we we developed an application that was just demoed uh, last week around helping veterans uh, find uh, apprenticeship opportunities and job opportunities. And so we had to make sure the data set sort of matched the profile of veterans coming out of the service today, which is different than the profile that if you had used a 10 year old data set, it would have looked um, in terms of that population of veterans uh, leaving, leaving the service. Um, so I think there's these challenges, I think the challenges and opportunities are both kind of flip sides in, in that sense. Uh, and I think uh, Kevin D'Souza in his report uh, laid it out very effectively, and I look forward to uh, hearing more from my colleagues here and for the discussion. Thank you, Dan. So, yeah. <laughs> so I'll start off by making this more interactive. Would anyone here be willing to take a nap in an automated test unless it's driving down the road? It might surprise you to learn that about 11% of surveyed drivers would be willing to do that, um, which, you know, given their recent data on Teslas driving underneath semi trucks getting the top sheared off suggests that there is a, a mismatch of people's understanding and the capabilities of AI systems um, and what they can actually deliver. Um, so I think of my job as a psychologist, former computer scientist, well, still in some sense, um, as trying to reverse engineer the human mind for secrets that we can steal from nature uh, to make better artificial intelligence applications. So my perspective, which I'll start off with, is sort of more on the limitation side of AI 
because I'm interested in sort of figuring out what AI can't do well yet so that we can sort of figure out what's, what's kind of missing from that picture. Um, so as has been remarked before, um, in the past, a lot of what we did uh, to mark improvements in AI was beating people at games. Chess, Go, um, StarCraft recently, um, although there's a lot of controversy about that. <laughs> um, so the interesting thing about these problems is that we as humans tend to think of them as very hard problems, but in terms of what computers are capable of doing, they're actually the easiest problems to solve because they have discrete state spaces and the objective function or the sort of conclusion of the game is very clearly defined, right? Whereas a lot of what we do as people uh, exists in a more or less continuous state space that is ill-defined and with victory conditions, if you want to think of it that way, is not at all being very clear. Like for example, having a conversation it's a very difficult thing uh, for, um, for people to do, um, but it seems natural to us, but it's, it's, it's actually really challenging. Our brain is doing a lot of hard work to enable us to have a conversation with someone else in a way. And when we try to build AIs that can have a conversation, we quickly realize how difficult that challenge is. You need to understand the frame of mind of the person you're talking to. You need to be thinking about what you should say in response to them, et cetera. Um, so, there's a whole world of things that we do very well, so well that we don't even understand how hard it is to do well. And this is a large part of why the AI field um, often stumbles in terms of um, predicting how long it's gonna take to do a, a certain thing, um, because we, don't under, we underestimate how hard it is for our brain to do things. Um, so um, just, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some things that uh, in my experience, AIs have traditionally done pretty badly and still do pretty badly. And this comes more from the deep learning uh, side of the equation, which we often <laughs> talked about. Um, so one of the things that we do well that AIs don't do is that we fail gracefully where AIs fail badly. Right? So what this means is that um, when we look at something and we don't know quite what to do, we have sort of fallback strategies that we can rely on to sort of get us out of trouble. And AIs typically uh, don't do that. So let me just show a quick little example here. Um, a lot of the sort of most famous success in AI recently within the artificial intelligence and from my perspective, the cognitive psychology perspective has been the way that AIs have been able to understand images. And this is you know, useful if you're just doing Google image search, you can now put up an image and Google will tell you what's in that image. It seems like a fantastic technology. Um, but it turns out that these algorithms, as impressive as they are, have some very exploitable weaknesses. Um, so this is, a phenomenon known as adversarial images, or what you do is you take a given algorithm and you, so for example, this picture of a car, which we would all agree was a picture of a car, but we would also say also, this is probably a car showroom. Um, so there's a lot of other things that we would pick up on there. But with a little bit of experimentation, you can figure out that if you add this noise to this image, you end up with this image down here that I think we would all agree is still a car but an AI would now very confidently with 99% certainty claim is a toaster. So we basically fiddled with the pixels a little bit in a way that sort of finds the cracks in the statistical mapping between the AI's representation of pixels and the classification label of a sports car. And we found this sort of like little micro crack that we can navigate with this pattern of pixels that gets us to toaster instead of sports car with an incredibly large amount of accuracy. Um, and this, this also works in other domains. So here's someone was saying, well, here's a picture of a rendered school bus, which the AI said, okay, that's a school bus, 100% certainty. Let's try to figure out what happens if we just rotate that school bus in this three-dimensional space. And I hear you have garbage truck with 0.99, punching bag, uh, 1.0, snow plow, 0.92. Here, this fire truck, very confidently labeled as a fire truck here, becomes a school bus when you lift it up off the ground. You know, we would think that's insane. Like, who would think that this is a school bus, um, but yet this is the kind of um, failures that AIs get into because they're not really self understanding what's there. They're just essentially building a very complicated regression from pixels onto the device. Um, and this also translates into the real world. So as, as he mentioned, uh, this is an experiment to see what you can do to a stop sign to get an AI uh, to think that this is instead of speed limit sign. So I think this is like two thirds of the time this image was considered to be a speed limit sign, a stop sign, with obviously very scary implications because if we have a bunch of Teslas running around, you just put a couple pieces of tape on stop signs and suddenly they're blasting through intersections. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of potential problems there. Um, 
So in many cases, we sort of misattribute the complexity of these systems and sort of misunderstand how capable they are because we sort of evaluate them in the micro context of like this image net competition. Um, and again, when people, like for example, you showed me a machine from an industrial room and I didn't know what it was, I would still say it's a machine. I wouldn't say that's a picture of a kitten. So even sort of way outside of my expertise zone, I can still come up with some kind of reasonable estimate of what that might be in a sort of broad sense, but also sort of estimate my uncertainty about how far I'm, I am out of my depth. Um, so, that's, so that's one of the things that current AIs don't, don't do particularly well. The other thing is that they don't really get meaning in the sense that we think they do, right? So when we see like show a school bus, we get a label of a school bus, it doesn't really understand anything about that that is really a school bus. But if you show a picture of, for example, so a good example might be some people ferociously arguing on a beach. And an AI might say, um, that's a picture of some people on a beach and they're having a vacation. Whereas we would look at that and say, okay, here's some people having an argument. We would make some, assert some internal inferences about the state of mind of those people. We would construct a whole story around that one image. Um, so, so AIs don't really, and when I talk about this, again, I'm just to sort of contextualize and talk about like deep learning approaches to image recognition. Don't really sort of see beyond the, the sort of classification part of it. Um, so I guess another thing that AI, so I like to say that you know, AIs can't really do the soft stuff. Um, and what I mean by that is that we also have the capability of reasoning without a clearly defined objective. Right? So you can drop us into a situation where we don't really understand exactly what's going on, we can come up with a coherent plan of action um, to at least get the information that we need to be able to make the decisions that we need. Um, so that's another case in which it, it can be difficult for AIs to, uh, to, to come to grips. Um, another big one, which I think has been a, a, a really hot topic lately is what's called overfitting. Folks have heard of overfitting as an issue. So the joke here is that an AI walks into a bar, the bartender asks, what are you having? And it says, I'll have what everyone else is having. Um, so the idea is that AIs are only as smart as the training data that they are tested, that they're trained, and then eventually tested. So um, what this means is that if you uh, train up a system in one particular configuration, and then you, you face it with a corner case, some sort of slightly out of, out of the normal ballpark range of situation, uh, an AI might fail in very catastrophic and unexpected circumstances, whereas people would tend to sort of figure out, you know, at the very least, oh, this is outside of my circumstances, I'm going to pass this up, up the chain. Uh, so a good example of overfitting is um, a sort of an analysis that someone did recently did where they looked at the, the recent crop of computer um, approaches to image recognition, which have been trying to get better and better at recognizing natural images, just pictures of scenes and things. Those, those algorithms have been getting better and better in terms of their accuracy on the image net competition to a point of like 99% or something like that. It's very impressive. These algorithms have also been getting um, deeper and deeper, meaning that they've got more and more layers. Some of them now have literally hundreds of layers of processing. But it turns out that if you compare those algorithms that are very good at the image net competition to images that are outside of the image net competition. They're actually doing worse than the algorithms from several years ago. What they're actually learning to do is exploit the regularities in the kinds of images that are chosen for image net, which is not necessarily characteristic of all the images out there in the world. So for example, one of the things that image net pictures of people tend to have is a sort of certain distance from the camera, which means that eyes are sort of within a certain range of pixels with an image net, uh, which means that those algorithms are bad at people farther away or closer than that sort of distribution of possible images. Um, but another, I mean, this, this crops up in a lot of other ways. So for example, we just heard on the car radio on the way over here today that they just found out that um, algorithms for uh, detecting pass, uh, passerbys or pedestrians in uh, sort of autonomous driving scenarios are 5% worse at detecting people uh, with a darker skin color than people with a lighter skin color, with obviously terrible uh, implications for what that means about public safety and public perspectives with, um, with, with racial bias. Um, so so these, these little things can crop up in, in dangerous ways if things get sort of pushed into the public sector prematurely. 
Um, so, you know, on the one hand, AIs have these limitations, but on the other hand, we as humans also have a sort of tendency that's kind of undeserved in many cases. Um, and we do this in many cases on the basis of social cues. Uh, I think it was Dan Danette who was working with Rod Brooks. They were, they were trying to build a sort of childlike robotic platform for interaction and it had eyes and it had eyebrows. And someone asked him, you know, how are you gonna convince people that this thing is smart? And he said, well, when you look at these eyes moving around and following you in the room, the challenge is gonna be to convince people that it's not smart. So the mere act that eyes will follow you around the room and the eyebrows might move in some sort of sympathetic fashion can lead people to do all kinds of beliefs about the state of mind of that, of that thing, even though it's just a simple tracking algorithm, so maybe pseudo-random fluctuations of the eyebrows. So the sort of flip side to the coin that AIs have these limitations is that in many cases, um, people might actually be prone to um, giving them too much trust. And in particular, on these much thornier problems of complex decision making where it's even harder to sort of evaluate how well the algorithms are doing. Um, so I think um, we might have been you, Dan, who was saying this, you know, one of the things we can do, um, maybe one of the best approaches for using AI is to uh, help facilitate the decision making rather than to be the entities that are actually making the decisions at this point. Always saying something like that too. Um, so yeah, I guess that's my sort of perspective is just to sort of keep track of what we think AIs are doing um, well versus poorly. Um, now, there's a whole other side of AI, uh, apart from the, the current rush of deep learning, uh, which is the, what's called GoFi, or good old-fashioned AI. Um, and so there are some folks who are saying that what we really need to do is to marry those two approaches. We need to sort of take some of the lessons from the symbolic versions of artificial intelligence and mix them together with some of the newer insights and then maybe with this multiple uh, approaches we can come up with uh, more robust solutions. Thank you, Ben. This is really very insightful, like a very different perspective from the first two speakers, which is really, I, I hope that it uh, sparks some new uh, ideas and questions. So I think that Dave, you want to pick up next and then we'll do I don't know if we should put the slides up. Yeah, you can. Yeah, I mean, so uh, I'll sure. how would you do? Yeah. All right. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I did make some. What the heck? I thought <laughs> I'll just hand uh, out these slides. Um. <laughs> all right. So I, I guess maybe I ought to start with a bit of a caveat and say. Um, you know, I, I'm, I wouldn't say that I'm, uh, I, I'm not an AI person. I just run straight out. But what um, I have a strong interest in is data analytics and big data and uh, trying to apply them in the organization that I work in, which is the U.S. Government Accountability Office, which is a federal legislative branch um, legislative branch agency and what we do is uh, we do audits performance what we call performance evaluations uh, various kinds of other assessments including impact and outcome outcome uh, uh, assessments or uh, uh, evaluations of US executive branch federal uh, government agencies and programs and our work is um, actually, who know who has heard of GAO? Okay, so for some of you who are maybe from other countries, we're a supreme audit institution, so that may clarify a little bit. But um, so anyway, that's the kind of thing we do. So everything we're doing at GAO, I would call it GAO, uh, is um, is is couched within that kind of a framework. We're doing evaluations of government programs and agencies at the request of Congress. Um, so we actually get request letters from Congress to do particular evaluations. And they can be on a huge array of topics. We cover all federal branch agencies except for sort of the intelligence agencies. 
And um, so everything from physical infrastructure to justice reform to social, social services to international affairs to defense, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we hit on a lot of sort of management and administration topics. So things like uh, fraud is a big one that we do. Um, we do a lot of work on the softer kinds of topics like uh, interagency collaboration in a particular program area. So maybe uh, emergency management. So we might look at the whole com complex of agencies and institutions and you know, NGOs and private sector and, uh, organizations that are working together to um, for, for emergency preparedness kinds of uh, purposes. So, so we do all that kind of thing. Now, how, where we are in terms of big data and, and sort of uh, data analytics is kind of in a liminal uh, state right now. So we're butting up against big data problems more and more now. Um, we're trying to introduce an array of data analytics into the agencies to help us do things that are more sophisticated and more uh, useful for our readers, which includes Congress, but also people out in the public. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the challenge we have right now. So I've done a lot of things that are bumping up against analytics, bumping up against big data questions, and this has been a development over time in the agency, moving closer and closer to these kinds of problems and, and using these kinds of analytics. Um, so, so I guess, I guess that's um, sort of broadly what we do. Um, my role at GAO is uh, this, uh, basically this third bullet here. I'm a, I'm a design methodology and analysis consultant. I'm also an analyst on our projects, which we call jobs. And each project is oriented toward producing a particular report on a particular topic. Um, I work in the Applied Research and Methods Division, which has a, a whole array of uh, social science and hard science, actually, now um, uh, types of experts and specialists, so economists, sociologists, uh, accountants, uh, evaluators, and then we have uh, tech, tech, technical hard science specialists, so engineers and, um, and uh, chemists and, and biologists. So um, very broad unit, but you can, that, that may give you the idea that we have people who are thinking along these lines in terms of AI. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, not too much, about the work that I've done that have, has to do with data analytics and big data. And so one of the one of the topics I think that actually might set off uh, what I'm talking about in terms of this development, this liminal kind of state that we're in, is network analysis. So social network analysis. So uh, probably 15 years ago, I started trying to introduce the use of social network analysis in the agency. And network analysis, as you may know, is a methodology is an analytic that certainly has been applied within a big data context and possibly, you know, um, you know per, well, used in a predictive analytics context sometimes and also may have some relevance in AI. So that's sort of the connection that I'm trying to make here. Um, so we started out small with uh, network analysis and particularly uh, we started looking using network analysis um, around pandemic planning preparedness. So we uh, looked a lot at the plans that were being developed um, and we also looked at collaboration practices among mainly federal agencies but also public uh, private and NGO sector. So, so anyway over time we, we did that kind of thing and we eventually developed a basically a, an agency-wide kind of network survey and analysis framework that we've used over and over now on, on our projects and reports. Um, in more recent uh, years now, we've started to branch out beyond that kind of, kind of uh, survey-based approach. And 
now we're moving into things like fraud, it, using network analysis in the fraud sphere, um, using network analysis to analyze um, interna international trade and development flows and patterns, um, looking at uh, subcontracting within the federal government, which is a huge topic, you know, as you may know, in the defense area in particular, we're doing a lot of that kind of work. Also on uh, DOE, the Department of Energy, which is huge and does a ton of subcontracting. So we're getting large data sets from these kinds of agencies to, um, to do and we do some network analysis. With it. Another one that is kind of a burgeoning area right now is using network analysis on bibliometric data. And this sort of has a, has a, has a kind of a, a scope across pretty much all of our projects at the agency. Um, other things that I've gotten into, and I'm not gonna, I'll maybe say stuff about this later, but text analytics is, is now becoming something that we're pursuing uh, in this applied research and methods group and, um, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and I'm not gonna, some of the analytics we're using are you know, web scraping and uh, so sort of fuzzy matching and, and text classification. And these are at varying levels of development at this point in time. So predictive analytics, and we started to use that in the fraud area. Um, so if we have, for example, uh, if we have indicators of potential fraud of particular organizations or people within a particular domain, we can use that to train models uh, for um, predicting who else within that domain. Uh, potentially uh, fraudulent, somebody you'd want to look at. And, and then fraud analytics, I'm not going to say, I, I can say more later about that. But so, so in terms of key challenges relating to big data and AI, um, there's a lot of inertia involved in trying to bring an agency like ours into this kind of world. And there are ingrained practices. People have been hired with specific skills that are related to the audit and evaluation work we do, but they, by and large, they don't have analytics or big data skills. So, so, so you've got to turn this shift in some way. And we're trying. We've been trying to do that now for the past four or five years. So it's very, you know, there's an internal learning process trying to bring analytics into um, the particular schemes that we use or organizational schemes we use to produce these reports. Um, so bringing in new pr precedents and practices and learning new tools and, and, and standards for, for conduct and um, organization within our agency. And then um, kind of where things are going. Um, yes, so there's a big movement now to start hiring analytics type people. And we've created something called the um, uh, Science Technology Assessment and Analytics Division within the agency. So this is a big development within our agency. And one piece of that uh, unit is a data innovation lab, data innovation lab. And we're probably gonna be hiring a uh, uh, chief data officer for that. So we're definitely moving in that direction, but there's a lot of complexity to making that happen and, and then applying it within, within an agency like ours. So um, I'm gonna leave it at that. There may be a reason to talk about some of this other stuff. Great, thank you so much, David. This is really like, I mean, completes the picture from the government side, like how yeah. you know, what's happening, at least from in one agency. Um, right, right. Like, uh, I mean, that's one thing. I mean, right, it's just right. one agency in every area. Yeah, really, that's right. Like, there's, there's so many. Yeah, that's right. You know. Um, so I think Jane. Um, so <laughs> I think it should we put a mic close to her here, or we can, uh, we can see what, how that works. Yeah. So Jane, should we display your slide? Uh, would that be helpful? Um, sure. Okay. Could um, I set the slide? Uh, is the Jane's And while we're getting the slide going, I just want to say um, 
thank you all for bearing with um, the fact that I'm not there in person. I very much wanted to be there in person. Um, but um, uh, as Asim said, I was sidelined by a sports injury. I'm proof that you don't have to be an NFL player to get a concussion. Um, I got hit in the head with a squash ball. And uh, they have, so I have been sidelined from travel by my doctor. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe if I got a lot bigger and stronger, I could be in the NFL. But anyway, uh, so um, I'll also start with a caveat, which is that I'm not an AI or data analytics person myself. I am an, uh, I am an observer of government, and I have looked at city data officers. I've talked to a bunch of state and county data officers. Um, oh, I don't know if you can see me. I'm holding up my IBM publication. Dan uh, did a show and tell of publications, but not mine. So there we go. There's my IBM publication about federal chief data officers. Um, so the observations I have are kind of from the perspective of organizationally, what do I see as the keys to success to getting a big data analytics or AI um, organizational transformation. Um, so, um, you know, before launching into that, I think you all, by virtue of taking a half a day to, to join this conversation, are already believers in the value. But, uh, but just in case, let me um, kind of before diving into the other stuff, talk about what I see as the value. Um, and and in my opinion, we are really at the very beginning stages of understanding just how powerful data can be in government. So um, first I'll talk about my city of Boston, which I think is one of the great um, examples of applying data in government. So my city is set to save about $5 million on fuel costs because of smart routing of school buses. And this was a project that wasn't even done by the awesome analytics team in Boston. It was done by a couple of um, MIT students. And we got a uh, private sector company to donate the prize money, held a hackathon, and uh, came up with a way to save not just $5 million, but also 20,000 pounds of carbon emissions. So, proud of my city. Um, the other thing Boston does is save a million dollars a year on energy costs simply by using uh, sensors, you know, so Internet of Things, um, by monitoring uh, temperatures in buildings. They can do things like micro adjustments to fans that have no perceptible change in uh, temperature to the public, uh, but still save, uh, like I said, a million bucks a year. and $40,000 a year just at my local library where, yes, I do, I do still have to wear a sweater in the summer because it's so well air conditioned. Um, so no appreciable change in uh, what the public expects. Um, at the federal level, there are lots of great examples, uh, but just because um, opioids are on my mind lately, uh, the HHS Office of Inspector General has a data scientist who uh, used big data technology to um, lead the investigation that led to a billion dollar takedown of an opioid prescribing fraud um, from uh, Medicare. So uh, I could I could actually go on the whole rest of the day talking about the benefits of um, big data and uh, analytics and government, but um, but we're supposed to talk about the benefits and challenges. So I want to if we go to the slide. Um, you can see that I've divided this kind of into two pieces. One is the uh, challenge of getting a data organization up and running in government. And then the other side of the slide is about uh, kind of, if you think of it as launching on the left, on the right, it's about the continuous sailing forward. Um, so um, pretty much, the most critical thing is executive buy-in, right? As I study successful and less successful data analytics efforts in, uh, in government, 
um, what I notice is that when you have a mayor, a county exec, a governor, a cabinet secretary who really pays attention and who is focused on data, that's where all the senior staff know that they have to listen to the data officer and have to participate, contribute data. Um, so executive buy-in is absolutely critical. Um, and having a clear mission often stems from the chief executive uh, making it a priority. And sometimes that's because they've issued an executive order or a memo or a policy directive, but that they have said, this is what analytics is going to do. And I think it's important to write it down and to communicate it because otherwise, as data officers tell me, they go to meet with someone and want to talk about, you know, predictive analytics or artificial intelligence or Internet of Things. And when they go to meet with someone, instead they're asked to fix the printer. Right. So the idea of separating uh, technology operations and, you know, what's going on with the servers from the power of data and analytics is something that can be called out in the uh, mission statement. Um, and then I think another critical piece of the launch is figuring out the right organizational structure. And I think that there are as many right answers to the question as there are types of existing organizations. You know, some are better off centralized versus decentralized. Um, and I think that, um, again, going to my example of the city of Boston, the city of Boston uses an a hybrid of the centralized and decentralized. We've got um, a couple dozen super staff at the uh, citywide analytics unit, but then um, a number of entities, the Boston Public Schools, the uh, police department have their own analytics teams and the central staff doesn't serve every agency. They serve the ones that don't have their own analytics staff. So for example, the fire department uh, gets their services from the central analytics uh, team. So um, the other thing about launch is to create a team and it's important to have a diverse team because you want to have different skills. Um, those who code are necessary, but there's nothing to code unless you figure out what's the business problem that you're solving. And the most critical thing in, I think, in any research endeavor, whether it's big data, analytics, AI, uh, you know, or kind of um, social science research. I think the most important thing is clearly defining your research question. And to do that, you really need uh, business process analysts um, who can get into the uh, customer business problem. So, um, you know, I think for launch, those are the keys to success that I would uh, point to. In terms of keeping an analytics program on uh, a successful track in government, I think uh, create a strategy, document the strategy, share the strategy so that as you're going, people know what they can expect. Um, and also it helps the team, you know, it doesn't just help externally to customers, it helps the team know uh, what they're about and be able to connect back to purpose. Um, and then I think some early wins can be very important in getting um, legitimacy, getting visibility, getting momentum for an analytics program. Um, I've been working with the city of Chicago for, I don't know, four or five years. And when they first started their analytics program, the the then CIO went out and met with every single agency and explained, hey, this is what we can do with big data analytics. This is how we can help improve your um, operations. And it took about a year between the um, kind of almost marketing of the effort and the first round of analytics projects that were successful. And um, once mid-level and senior managers in government started to see, oh, I could get a 20% improvement by working with these data people, I could be more efficient, I could, you know, one example, if 
if any of you have been to Chicago, you've probably been to a restaurant and um, most cities inspect restaurants to make sure that there aren't unsafe conditions that can make us sick. Well, no surprise, most cities don't have enough restaurant inspectors. Chicago worked with the analytics team to get a predictive model, 32 different variables, including weather and, you know, uh, calls for service for disturbance on, on the 311 line, uh, stray animal calls, all kinds of different variables factored in. And um, uh, they're now able to get to the most high risk cases seven days sooner. So if you went to Chicago, ate at a restaurant, didn't get sick, you can thank analytics. Um, but, um, uh, you know, getting some positive press really helped get momentum, helped build um, some credibility for the program and, and switched from a place of having to go out and beat the bushes to market the program to a place where there's um, quite a bit of demand for analytics and a um, great deal of buy-in. So what happens once you've got some momentum, you've got to make, make sure to maintain credibility by doing things like assuring data privacy and also assuring that um, algorithms are not built on data that has bias. Um, and uh, that's something where there is not yet a good housekeeping seal of approval for public sector analytics projects for um, ethics of algorithms. Um, I was part of a team that developed a toolkit uh, we put it out last fall in beta form. If you know anyone who is doing a public sector analytics project and wants to use this toolkit, please contact me so we can get you using the toolkit and giving feedback because it's still in beta form. Um, anyway, so those are some thoughts on the keys to success. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> oh gosh, now it's echoing. I hope I didn't echo when I was talking. Right. right. Perfect. It was great. I think it's just we were able to also relate on the speaker here, so that was great. Okay, so I think I just wanted to open up before we go to the next round of questions. The panel, uh, like based on the responses so far and what you've heard, uh, do you have any questions for the panel? Uh, this is four for Rob and Brad. Rob was talking a little bit about what to do with big data, and Brad was talking about creating cognitive models. And there's a new uh, a new paper out by some folks at Princeton. Uh, it's got Agarwal, Peterson, and Griffiths, and they take the maybe we're familiar with the moral machine data. They do something I think is really interesting, in which they run a um, kind of machine learning uh, model on a really large data settings, millions and millions and millions of observations. And they uh, they see uh, they use that to fit the data to see how explanatory it is of people's decisions in these moral dilemmas. And then what they do is they compare it to a simpler model, like you like a basic like a regression or utility, utility maximization uh, model that has just some basic uh, variables in it. And then what they do is they take the residuals from the from the regression model and look and see compared to the predictions from the machine learning model when there is uh, like extreme variation based on the residuals. Which I think is really interesting. And then they were able to figure out which other, mo which other variables should be included in their regression model to get closer to the accuracy of the machine learning model. And so I thought this was a really interesting example of looking at the micro data, this really large administrative, not administrative data, but it's individual micro, micro level decision data. And uh, then having some more transparent models with like regression models, and they were able to get the accuracy really close over like, uh, uh, like on the once you use over 100,000 observations or something. So I was, I was curious, you know, uh, thinking about the cognitive models and thinking about uses of data, other ideas maybe the two of you or other people on the panel had about creative ways for using some of this micro level data that we're getting to help address some of the ethics issues that Paul was bringing up. If you've seen other examples of this or other creative ways of trying to merge 
models that we have a better sense of what the variables are and their strengths with uh, some of the machine learning, you know, because it can be kind of white box style. Just any like, other examples of stuff like that or any thoughts you might have about, because I'm really interested about how to uh, address the ethics question and uh, uh, dealing with some of the white box issues versus kind of traditional utility maximization models. Uh, yeah, I'll start with just a general observation that um, I've been around the, the neural network community long enough to have regression models can do a lot of the work of deep learning models just because one way to think about a, a neural network, which of course a deep, a deep learning model is just a, a many, 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 many computer layers, uh, because, because a typical squashing function in a, in a neural network uh, has this kind of sigmoidal property. Uh, a neural network with, with one layer is just a cascaded logistic regression. You're basically taking the regression, uh, doing a logistic regression on the input to the in interior layer, then interior layer to the, to the next base is two logistic reg regressions. So all in all a deep learning network is is 200, uh, uh, in essence, recursively structured regression. So, so okay, so then there are, there are gonna be then ways to represent that in some more compact form, I guess. It's, it's, yeah, unsurprising when you just say some of those results, but that's not what you're getting to. Uh, I, I think, you know, it, it always been this debate in, in AI from the, from the first, first and second generation AI was mostly top-down AI. We have today is mostly bottom-up AI. Bottom-up AI is much more uh, available to eat these micro data, to digest the micro data, but then you know, always the, the, the debate was how much, how far can you get there with the more top-down AI? And so my sense is that these the aggregate regression models are much, much more like, you know, you think people could articulate a rule for why they, did, why they did what they did, although the statements of cognitive science, but if you ask someone why, why, they, why they did what they did, they can't they can say that. Um, but whereas the neural networks, the trouble is that the deep learning models, they're, they're so black box that, you know, you just, you're, you're very, I think we're very reluctant, at least policymakers are very reluctant to actually trust them to, to, do, to do decision making, but they're only gonna use it as a decision support tool. Uh, because you, you don't know what the guts are going to do with it. So there's yeah, always this tension between kind of intelligibility versus uh, uh, fecundity or versus kind of uh, accuracy. Of the, uh, that, that's always going to be trade-offs in like, the cost of tools that we're, we're doing these days. I think it, it's uh, touching on that issue of sort of the inscrutability of the approach. Um, so, it, you know, people are on the one hand, afraid to trust these approaches because they're black box, so we don't really know what's going on. But on the other hand, we, we also sort of have a problem giving that agency to people, um, even though people's brains are similarly black box. So there's this sort of asymmetry in what we sort of uh, think of as, uh, I guess we're, we're comfortable with thinking of another person as having agency, even though their brain is just as opaque to us, or maybe it's more opaque than a layer just deep learning network. The person accountable though, right? Right, right, well, exactly, right. There's other things, there are other factors that come um, um, so, I, but but I think that it's not just about the sort of inscrutability. You're right; it's, it's accountability for sort of the, the key feature. Um, one of the things that I think is key to developing good approaches to making, for example, decisions in a moral or ethically constrained space is building a representation of internal dynamics of how that space exists, um, and. My assumption is that without being familiar with this particular, uh, with the data set or, or the modeling approach in this case, is that the, the representation would probably not be very robust yet at this point in time, in large part because we don't, even deep learning approach, which has um, been trained on all of these individual micro decisions, is still lacking sort of common sense aspects that a human brain has been trained up with at that point in time, which serves as a sort of fallback canvas on which to project a lot of these problems that are being presented to it. So even if a person has never had to grapple with, for example, what do I do in the case of cancer um, before in their life, they still got you know, a long time to understand what disease has kind of seen and heard about it. So there's a lot of there's a lot of rich and varied ways in which uh, this moral landscape intersects with the experience that a human adult has had after 20 years of learning all this stuff. Um, and I think until we learn how to build a representation space in AI architecture in some way that has that, that, that rich history and that sort of those complex dynamics, I know that this is unsatisfying because I'm just saying there's some magic there that we haven't captured yet, but I think that that's, 
that's still a part of it. And so, I mean, some of that is simply, you know, just time that a person has, you know, 20 years of experience. But then on the other hand, someone can say, yeah, but with these new accelerated AIs, we can give an AI a thousand years of simulated time, you know, in, in 20 minutes. Well, that's a little bit of exaggeration, but the point is, you know, that's not really the argument anymore. It's not just about the, the, the sort of sheer amount of data that's being processed by this network to sort of build that representational space, but there's something also about the way that the human brain represents the information that that, that might lead to certain approaches um, or representations that are qualitatively different than what we can still get out of these essentially complex regression systems. Um, and I, I think a large part of it is just sort of the training aspect, that the training of these approaches is sort of you're training the algorithm to predict the correct decision, which was the first one that the person made in that context. Um, whereas we're not being trained according to that same criterion of correctness. Uh, it's not really clear exactly what the objective function of the human mind is. It changes a lot from situation to situation. Can I pick up on that? I think that the, um, the example you're starting, Justin, is, is interesting because you, you're getting the outliers in the basic regression. And from a training perspective, it's not necessarily that you have to train the AI algorithm to deal with every outlier. You could train the AI algorithm to kick it over to a person, right? We, we can't deal with that particular way. If, if, if the AI algorithm takes from the, the outliers from the initial regression and the way you described it and says, this is too hard for me to compute for the reasons you, you suggested, we just don't, aren't able to do AI well that way. Then the, the cases where people challenge because there's an ethical issue or an issue of bias is often based on their unique um, circumstances as an individual. And in that case, maybe the AI potentially could, in, in terms of augmenting um, you know, human decision making and service provision, can know, all right, in this case, I'm just not gonna try. I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, stop and kick it over to the customer service manager or the uh, service provider in the government um, or the medical provider. And, uh, uh, and I think it's interesting to think about a training perspective as to train the AI to know when not to go too far. And, and your example struck me in that. Just to follow So, go ahead. Um, I want to just, okay, I want to just jump in there because Dan raised the issue of humans. The AI kicks it to a human, but I want to, um, and, and also, I think Brad used the word accountability. I, I have yet to see, other than in New York City, um, an executive, actually in New York City, it was the city council, not the mayor, but um, what I want to see is where a cabinet secretary, a governor, a mayor, a county exec, a department head says, I'm worried about this problem and I want someone to study it. And um, other than the handful of city chief data officers who have been actively participating in this conversation, um, I don't see policy people stepping up to say, we need somebody who's in charge of figuring this out. Um, and I don't know when that's going to happen, but anyway, that's what, that's one thing that I think we need to agitate toward. At the federal level, I think there are many examples of this, but it's a very, very concrete one. Not too far from here, over at HHS, I mean, there is a, uh, turns out a medical doctor who's in charge of public health in the country, and he has sitting on his shelf uh, a, a model that basically says, you know, if we were to wake up tomorrow and there is a very bad outbreak of H1N1 in San Francisco, when we arrive from the Pacific, does he shut down interstate trucking, yes or no? And he, and he's got that model on the shelf because 10 years ago he asked for it to be built and he wanted to study the problem and it's a very detailed model with all kinds of microscopic variables and uh, of course he's a, he or she, I don't remember who it is right now, is a, is, a, is a medical doctor with a lot of experience on working on epidemiology from a scientific point of view. So that's just one example of where, and sitting in this town, there are people who are, who are ready to go on a policy basis with, because they asked the question which you mentioned, that they already asked that four or five years ago. Well, I just wanted to pick up on that, that sort of augmented decision-making idea that several people have mentioned. And it seems like finding that sweet spot between is important. Um, and, but I wanted to pick up, a couple of you mentioned that you can, we can free ourselves up from low value work. And you 
talked about, Dan, how uh, maybe the AI can know when it's run into its limits and pass it back to the, to the individual decision maker who has more capacity to do that. But is there a value in low value work? That is, do people who are decision makers need to, in, in some sense, engage, need to be messing around with the Excel sheet themselves, you know, and seeing how different things connect? I mean, in my own role is coming, is figuring out how to allocate graduate funding. I only run up against the reality of budget limitations and the way that an administrator thinks because I have to start to think like an administrator and because I have to start to play with those numbers myself. As imperfect as I am in doing it, as much of a waste of time it is, I gain an understanding of what actually we're dealing with. And now I know just a little bit more about what it means to be making decisions in this position I've been given because I'm making these relatively easy decisions and I think now I can make a little more sophisticated decisions because of that. But I, but I had to do all that low value work to get there in a sense. So if you're taking that away from me and just bringing me in later, I might not appreciate all of the different, I might not have gone through my own human learning process to be able to make the moral judgments that I need to make. So I just want to add that or, or question that how is that part of the human learning through low value work might also be part of the, the augmented partnership model. So I think that's a really interesting observation. And it's almost the AI equivalent of, you know, kids don't do long division on paper anymore because they all use calculus. So they don't know how to add up a row of numbers. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, I think there's a difference between learning that goes on so you know how something works and sort of the ability to practice it quickly on the job. So you don't have to reconstruct the regression by, by basically doing it manually, which is how I learned to do it, you know, learning how to move up the graph. Um, when you've got, but you have to know how that works. So it's almost like we need to make sure that we're, we're training um, basic science and, and math in sort of how people use AI. I don't know that we want to require them to do, to build the regression map on the graph each time, but they ought to know those skills. And that's part of, I think, the challenge of when we think about 21st century workforce skills, it's not just about how to use the fantasy algorithm, it's about, to, it's about knowing how that's built. Uh, and being able to, to use it effectively. Yeah. I think right, and this is actually something I'm very concerned about in the workforce. Um, you know, you take a city like San Francisco with one data scientist at the city level for, you know, I don't know, maybe 5,000 city employees. In um, Chicago, there's one data scientist. In Boston, we have more, but if you think about the I don't know, 0.1%, some very, very small percentage of government workforce are data scientists. How do we bring up the data literacy of not 100% of the workers, but at least mid-level and senior managers who are making decisions? And um, my way of thinking about this is that I don't want every mid and senior manager in government to be able to create their own algorithms, but I want them to be smart enough about data, data science, AI, to be able to ask tough questions. So my analogy is this. Um, I think the management and executive track need to have the skills of a general contractor, right? A general contractor who builds my house doesn't do the electri electrical wiring and doesn't do the plumbing, but they know enough to make sure that that stuff is done right. And that's the future vision I have for leaders in government is that they can be the general contractors of data and analytics, where they know it's important, they bring it to the table, um, and they can, they, can, they can do the quality control. Uh, going back to, to Paul's point, I think that's a really interesting perspective. And you know, I, I think about a general contractor, I, I really like that analogy, but the question then is, how do they get that expertise? And I think in many cases, it's because they serve their time you know, in the trenches, so to speak. Right. And so if we, let's imagine that we sort of, this gets to your sustainability point, Jane, very nicely, I think, which is that, you know, if you imagine that we implement all these new changes, um, the first phase of that might actually seem very successful because the managers on the top end, there's people who sort of work through that process. And so they're good at still making those decisions. But then sort of the turnover next phase those people are still at that same level and they're still sitting on top of a whole bunch of sort of analytics approaches, but they no longer have that apprenticeship kind of 
approach, and so they may now lack the sort of intuitive intuition. Exactly, and that, that's why my focus is really on mid-level managers, because they're more likely to stay in government, whereas the, the appointed people, they're going to leave, right? I was appointed, I left. It was the people one notch below me who stayed and could, had the power to continue things. And the other thing your, your uh, analogy points out is there's a difference between what I'll call the AI users, people who are using data and sort of benefit and make this, from what I'll call the AI builders, people, the, the experts that are building the algorithms have to, have to know the basics as to how you get there. Yeah. You don't, you don't have to know how to, this is not a perfect analogy, but you don't have to know how to build a car to drive a car, but you still have to go through standards and learning and get educated how to, how to drive safely. And it's just a different set of skills uh, in those two scenarios. Yeah. Sorry, to build on that, the question of how do you do that in a, in a workforce where we're always on the go, and we know now a lot don't want to be doing professional development activities, or they don't take it seriously. And so how do we find that sweet spot of making them more illiterate about these things? without them like, oh, another professional development activity, I don't really want to do this. I'm not really paying attention, and mine's elsewhere. Where, how do you bridge that gap to teach those mid-level managers about kind of everything? Yeah, one, one thing I, <clears throat> from my own, my own organization I'd say is, um, <clears throat> we are hiring people with analytics expertise, um, and the people who are kind of, I guess, legacy, but, but who, who predominate in the organization are basically policy, policy analyst, an analysts with public administ primarily public administration and policy analysis backgrounds. And um, what I think is happening is there's a um, incongruence in the way those two sides think about the world. You know? And so, Part of bringing those two together is, yes, okay, let's get the policy analysts more knowledgeable about analytics, um, but it also is for the analytics people to be able to articulate better what yeah. they can bring to the table in terms of answering specific questions. So we're talking here about valuation questions, audit questions, things like that. So, so it's, it's necessary for both sides to sort of come together. One way to um, kind of ameliorate that is to have people who can, to bring people in or have people who can uh, interpret, interpretively uh, and conceptually translate from one side to the other. Um, and so, for example, I, that's, that's a role that I've been trying to play. Um, and um, so I'm a social scientist, a sociologist with um, you know, both a lot of qualitative research experience and quantitative research experience. I did my research, um, my dissertation research on economic and social political transition. Also, the Czechnese Kolatjevi Dishontik, who in Wolji Trist Kultura <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, uh, I I did my dissertation on uh, economic and, and political transition in Poland in the uh, 1990s in Wuch. <laughs> He's from Wuch. Um, so um, anyway, that's that's uh, so that's my background and. So I, I've been working towards trying to fill that kind of role in my organization. If I can mention uh, one other thing, that I would maybe shock them as kind of a risk factor. And this comes from a little bit of experience of looking through another transition that happened about 15 years ago. So about 15 years ago, uh, the, the DOD uh, tran transitioned from having a lot of models that were of kind of a uh, aggregate nature that they were using for various types of functions and they, and they moved to Think about uh, having a think about combat models. And so combat models were models in which you could have every uh, individual actor, every individual soldier represented, the weapon represented, etc. And so it was a, a big move when enough computer power became available, like somewhere around in the, in the early aughts. When uh, and so you basically had have, have you know, models of, of 
army engagements or military engagements where they have a highly high computationally intensive representation. So it's like line of sight, it's almost video game quality stuff too. But the quick background is that so at that time, and before the first standards created, there were a lot of uh, contractors, and I, 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 this is a kind of quick uh, DOD contractor thing again, think about here mostly. They basically, were selling a lot of snake oil. They were basically, there were, because there were no standards, they were, they were promising things that they, that, that were, to be honest, they were you know, promising more than they could actually deliver. And then they, they, what the comical example was, so at one time, they called into the evaluation of these things, and, um, and the general uh, who was looking at you know, the vendors, the product also, and we're looking at you know, some particular example of engagement, said, um, to what extent are, are these uh, artificial soldiers in the model uh, displaying heroism? And of course, the real, the real, the proper answer has been, well, they aren't doing that at all, because that's not part of what, like, well, the part, no one knows what the hell that means anyway, right? Uh, and, but, but the reaction from the contractor was, well, they don't really have that but kind of, and the general says, well, come back to me when you've got that programmed in. And sure enough, they came back about a month later with it before they programmed in, right? And so that, that's how it is. <laughs> now, what I, what I see right now today in the data science world is the rough analogy, the sense that there are a lot of vendors out there Selling things that are going to be going to solve all problems, right? They're going to do it's the it's the snake oil of the, of the, of the current environment. And, you know, whether your problem is you know you got to compute an eigenvalue, or whether you have to you have to compute a, you know a simple average. And they, their their generic software can solve every problem. Probably do it on the cloud. Probably do it uh, you know do it um, uh, you know uh, faster than real time. Have all I'll have all the jargon, right? And it seems to me that right, unfortunately, right at, at this present moment, we don't have any standards and. Uh, those have to evolve, and that's going to take a decade. And so, in the process, at least for the federal customers, I for the federal uh, people involved with the federal work, there's just there seems to be this high risk associated with uh, buying the tools that are not not really the right ones for the problem you need to solve.